Hi, Natalie. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Natalie, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, thanks for coming early. Am I the only one? Yeah, but, um, yeah, but it's, it, it won't start for a few minutes. I asked uh, some of the girls to be here a little early. To, hopefully the mayor or Megan is going to be here a little early. Do you know, Natalie, if you guys are, did you guys come up with questions? Um, I don't know. I'm gonna look right now, Let's see. Because I know that Jalissa did that document. I'm just yeah. Do you have any questions you wanna ask? So I think, I, she, mean, I was hoping that the girls, build people would ask questions because I know she's gonna have a presentation, but we'll see how long. I mean, I could come up with some questions as she's like doing the presentation. Okay, great. That would be awesome. Um, oh, where is it? Um, oh, it's not on by me. I'm looking right now to see. There we go. Oh, okay. There is question. So it's under Google Docs. Okay. And it's, um, I'm not sure, it should have been shared by you. Yeah, it was shared with you under, just go, it's, it's called Girls Build Zoom Questions for Mayor Megan. Oh, okay, okay. Just take a look-see. That's good. Hey, Caitlin. Oh, I'm unmuting you. Hi, Marissa. Um, okay, so Marissa. Yes. Oh, hey. Um, okay, so, so, what do you what do you have to say what are you going to say at the beginning okay because uh, i'm um, going to say welcome everybody thank you for coming i want to introduce you to marissa the president of girls build our campaign so do you want to talk about your campaign or should i just, just introduce you um you i, I can talk about the campaign if okay you... i'll just say marissa the president of the girls build team and our campaign campaign or um vote for change team i'll just say that mm -hmm. you could talk about it and then introduce megan and then she could take it away she'll have she's going to share her screen okay so that's how it's going to work so i'm hoping that she gets here a couple minutes early so we can just confirm that with her but i know that she had a powerpoint um prepared and i'm hoping that she's able to share her screen here she comes here she goes Hi. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Good. These are the girl. These are our leadership team um, girls right now, and I, I just asked them to join a few minutes early. So, um, so I wanted to see if um, you could, if it's just test out to make sure you can share your screen. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Let me see if that look on my desktop and. Make sure I have my thing open. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so let me I 
Hi, Lacey. We're just, um, if you're just joining, we're just trying to make sure that um, Megan can share her screen. So that works. I think. Let me, hold on. Let me put it on my desktop so it's like easy for me to find. Okay. I don't know what I just clicked. <laughs> Hold on. Is it is it sharing right now? Sorry. Yeah, we can see. Oh, sorry about that. So you're like looking at me fumbling around. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, let's see. There we go. So you can see it now. Uh, I can see, I can see this just a bunch of documents. Oh, really? Okay. Hold on. Let me stop the share and let me see what's going on. That's weird. Cause it's like up on mine and let me get it off of, huh? That is odd. Hi, everybody. If you're just joining, we're just trying to figure out um, screen share for the presentation today. So hang tight. Let's see if this works. Do you see it? Does that yes. work? Yep. That's Got it. Works. Okay, yeah. cool. So I will stop sharing. Great. All right. We have. Hmm. Okay. I think I'll just give it one more minute. I'm trying to let everybody in here. Do you know how many folks um, might be joining? I do not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know that we had, we're, Wednesdays, just so you know, um, Megan, Wednesdays are a day where we don't have class scheduled. I'm sure you know okay. that part. So, so I'm making you of, do this without <laughs> you're having to. <laughs> no, no, I, I have to work. I mean, these, these students all have to do stuff, but they're all um, working on their assignments on their own today. But okay, first time out for a, a big Zoom um, presentation for, because I'll be doing several. Um, so... I'll continue to let people in. Okay. I don't know why I enabled the waiting room. That's kind of annoying, but um, now I know this is not great, but. Um, so it's so that you don't get Zoom bombed. <laughs> That's the oh, is that what it is? The yeah. Okay. It's so that you know who's like coming in and joining the meeting. Um, right, I don't recognize all the names, so that's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Thank you. Uh, so I do. So uh, thank you. Um, I guess we should still call you Mayor Megan or uh, as of Monday evening. Um, I rotated back onto the council. Um, so you can just call me Megan. It's okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Megan, for coming. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to introduce our president of uh, Girls Build. Um, team, the Vote for Change team, and then she will talk a little bit about our campaign and then introduce you. Okay, Marissa, take it away. Okay, hi, um, I'm Marissa. I'm a junior at Culver City High School, and our campaign this year is focused on helping students become informed voters and making smart voting dis decisions in elections. So I'm here to introduce Miss Megan Sally Wells, 
who was the mayor of Culver City for the past year and is currently a Culver City council member. Throughout her time as mayor, she made Culver City a sanctuary city, made Culver City a 100% renewable energy city, and spearheaded efforts to phase out oil drilling in the Inglewood oil field. She also helped in the creation of the Safe Routes to School program, and she holds two bachelor degrees from UCLA. So without further ado, here is Councilwoman Mayor Sally, Megan Sally Wells. Thank you, Marissa, for that introduction. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to virtually meet with you. We had we had planned uh, a big uh, event at the Frost, but of course that then the pandemic happened. So <laughs> now here we are in this strange new time, full of a lot of questions and. Um, and I would argue maybe a time where voting is going to be more important than ever because, you know, lives are on the line and leadership matters in, uh, in a moment of crisis and, and pretty much all the time. Um, so thank you for um, being leaders and for organizing this event and for all of those, uh, those who are joining you know, thanks, thanks for listening in. I, um, I prepare, oh, that is actually the wrong. <laughs> let me, let me find the correct uh, PowerPoint. Um, let's see. I worked on it last night. And here we go. Okay, now I have it. Um, And that is still the old one. Yikes. Um, well, first, what we'll do while I try to find the right document, and I apologize, I thought I was all ready. Um, if you want to ask any questions um, right off the bat. Um, oh, here we go. Aha, I got it. Sorry about that. It'll just take me a second. Phew, here we go. Yikes. I haven't done a PowerPoint in a long time, so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Slideshow. Okay, so now I'm going to share the screen and, and do, sorry about that technical <laughs> uh, problem, but uh, I'm going to share a little PowerPoint and then we'll have um, ample time for, uh, for questions. Are you able to see the the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yes, we can see it. Okay, cool. Um, so the the main topic is, you know, why does voting matter? And I'm going to want to hear a lot from you about what your perspective is. And um, I'll just share some of the things that I've both seen as a, um, just as a resident in this city, but then also um, somebody who's elected in office and, and really beginning to understand like the, the immense the, the immensity of the decisions that are made on a governmental level that you kind of don't think about in everyday life. Um, so that I think the first reason why voting matters is it's, it, it's, it's really about your future. The decisions that are made on every single layer of government um, have a huge impact on your life. Um, there's a saying that I learned uh, very early on when, uh, when I was first elected to the city council and it was a woman mayor um, who said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. 
what does that <laughs> expression mean? It means that if you're not directly involved in the decision making uh, by being a decision maker yourself or by actually voting and helping decide who those leaders are, um, it's highly likely that you will, you stand to lose if your voice isn't being heard. Um, representation is extremely important. Um, by and large, younger people have a tendency not to vote. So proportionally in the population, they make a great uh, part of our population. But if they're not voting, then their interests are not being represented um, in in decision making from a city council mayor uh, level, from the presidential, and pretty much everything in between. Um, and so the it it's just I. I I think we'll get into the discussion a little bit later, but like the importance of voting is something that's at this point like a life or death decision. Um, there is a little video um, that the, was shown on the Jimmy Fallon show. So I'm gonna see if this um, plays. Hey, oh, hey, okay, Jimmy. you can you see doing? it here. I'm on my way to Voting Avenue. Yeah. Voting Avenue, what's that? It's a place you get to go when you turn 18. It means you get to vote. How do you get there? I'll show you the way. Who are you? Well, I'm a parent, of course. Follow me. So you say that you're 18. Well, I'll tell you what that means. It's an opportunity for something new. You gotta do your civic duty. So go on with a check and voting down the street, down in Voting Avenue. Voting Avenue? That sounds far out. It is far out, but it's also closer than you think. I wanna know more. Who can go there? Take it away, ballot. It don't matter who you are. If you walk or drive a car, it don't make a difference if you're red or so what do you think, Jimmy? I think I'm going to like Voting Avenue. Can we go? Sure. All you got to do is register. Go online to vote.gov or just say, Siri, how do I vote? Here's how to buy a code. Siri. To complete your registration, just fill out an application. It's as easy as two plus two. Then you're making your selection, taking part in your election. Left out to Cruz and Fulton Avenue. But the presidential election doesn't happen until 2020. Why are we singing about this now? There's an election every year, Jimmy, and state and local elections can be just as important, if not more. Well, what would I even vote on? Well, since you're out there. Legislators, governors, and senators as well. You can vote for your state animal to be in the jail. Vote for greener policies if you're a fan of trees. And vote for being vegetables if you hate peas. You can vote for judges. You can also vote for mayors. You can ride at any point of life. Whether women's issues be the water or a wall, the best thing about voting is that voting has it all. Wow, voting is amazing. Well, does it make you want to sing about it? It sure does. Then be my guest. It really is the trouble. Now I'm feeling out the sparkles. It wouldn't be a simple thing to do. From New York to Sacramento, every lady, every gentle, and she back that way down Voting Avenue. So don't miss the possibility to take part in your democracy. All right, so there are a ton of things to vote on on pretty much every level of government and a federal, you know, a national level. You have things like president, Congress. Um, on a statewide level, you have governor, senators, assembly members. Uh, in the LA County, uh, you have the Board of Supervisors. And in LA County, that office has a ton of power. Um, each supervisor in LA County represents 2 million people, a huge portion of our nation's population. And the amount, the budget that they have is like through the roof. 
And um, a lot of the services that we depend on, like mental health services, they have, of course, the LA County Sheriff's, they've got, um, you know, our Department of of public health right now, a lot of the the decisions that are being made about the COVID-19 response are happening through LA County Department of Public Health, homeless services, like just metro type things, like a lot of that is decided through the LA County uh, Board of Supervisors. And there's actually um, a, our seat here locally in uh, that the, the supervisor district that represents Culver City is up for a vote in November. So that's gonna be a hugely impactful um, election in particular. Um, on a city level, you have everything from uh, mayor, city council members, Culver City and some of the smaller cities in California um, have this rotating mayor. So what you don't actually vote directly for mayor in Culver City or Santa Monica or West Hollywood and a lot of these other cities. Um, you vote on the city council members and then they rotate. Uh, but in places like Los Angeles and New York City and, uh, and a lot of other cities, you'll vote directly for the mayor. And then even Inglewood, you can vote directly for the mayor um, and the city council members are, are um, their own body. Um, of course, there are school board elections and um, that also in November, uh, there'll be uh, board seats up in our local uh, school board for Culver City, um, as well as the city council uh, this, this November. And then there's all kinds of like ballot measures. All in, in California, we have a ton of ballot measures, some of which can be very confusing, but they touch things like <clears throat> renter protections, uh, you know, whether you can be evicted or not. Um, a lot of tax measures go on the ballot. Um, and, and there's just like a whole host of things. I, I think the effect of having a lot of things on the ballot is that it turns out to become a little bit confusing, confusing. And that's where education, like voter education, um, becomes really important. Um, Unfortunately, like we don't have great turnout, <laughs> not a lot, like even the people who can vote um, don't vote uh, as often. I was just reading that, you know, in, in the last presidential election, um, it was what, like in California, something like 53% of the eligible voters actually turned out to vote in this election that had so much consequence on, on, our, on our daily lives and kind of our future. Um, so, you know, the, it's, it's been a real problem to make sure that people um, are able to get out and vote. So, you know, some of the ways that we can encourage more people to vote is just by making it easier to vote. Um, in California, we've done a lot to try to extend the amount of time that you can vote in and kind of make like registration a lot easier. It was just like a year ago, about a year ago that you could register to vote online, maybe two years. You can register to vote online as opposed to, you know, mailing in uh, or going to the DMV. Um, there are other things like uh, making sure that folks have trusted sources of information so that you can um, actually find the information about, okay, who, who is this judge I'm w voting for? Uh, what these presidential candidates, what do they really stand for? So we as kind of as a society need to make sure that we're, we're identifying these sources for information that's not just like advertisements, but where you can really have some confidence in the information that's being given so you know who to vote for. Um, I, teaching the history of voter suppression, I think is really important because it's, it, you know, people throughout history have fought so hard for the right to vote and I think the more people know about that history, the more they're able to realize that, you know, this hard won fought uh, right, hard, hard fought right, is something that I really need to exercise because, you know, there are still societies where people can't vote. Even in, in the United States, um, 
you know, if you've been in prison, uh, it's really hard to get your right to vote back. There are, uh, there's a lot of voter suppression even today in the United States and, and all over the world. And so kind of being aware of that um, helps us, um, I think, not only make sure that the people who should be voting have the right to vote, but then actually, you know, if don't take that right for granted either. Um, so in there at, at the top of this, you have a link to um, SOS is the Secretary of State who kind of runs elections.ca.gov. And there's a lot of uh, our Secretary of State has done a lot to try to uh, encourage uh, high school students to get involved. And as Alex Padilla, actually when he, he did this whole tour all around um, California and the very first one he did was at Culver High at the Robert Frost and he gave a big presentation. I forget if it was two years ago or maybe three years ago, um, but uh, Culver City High as a, like a democracy school um was uh has has really been involved in in this kind of statewide movement to encourage uh younger folks to vote and that's really important one of the new things that he did was make it uh, make you uh make pre-registering to vote uh a possibility um and so uh, that's something that i hope that if 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 all of you who are at least 16, I hope that you're all pre-registered to vote because that makes it that much easier um, to just vote uh, later, you know, once you actually turn 18. I think they, and the Secretary of State did a video that I'm gonna show you too. We are constantly told that we are the future, that our generation will make a difference. We are told that our time will come, that we are the leaders of tomorrow. Well, we shouldn't have to wait to make a difference. Our time is now. Our time is now. Our time is now. Sure, we may not be old enough to vote, but we can contribute in other ways. And for those of us who are 16 or 17, we can actually pre-register to vote. Pre-register to vote. Pre-register to vote. California, you can pre-register to vote at 16 or 17 years old and vote when you turn 18. Because we don't have to wait to get informed. We don't have to wait to have our voices heard. We can volunteer to be poll workers. We can contribute to our communities. We can make change. Our time is now. Our time is now. Our time is now. Pre-register at 16 or 17. And vote at 18. And if you're 18, there's no excuse. Your time is now. Visit www.registertovote.ca.gov and pre-register or register to vote today. So here's just like a little information. If you go on that um, Secretary of State uh, website, there's, there's a lot of information. And I'll just um, share the presentation uh, with Ms. Madrid so that we, so if you wanted to make that available, you know, if any of this information you wanted to make available, you can. Um, and then there's also, a, and I think what we can do is like, we can get into the, you know, the, the vote 16 idea, it's something that a lot of um, Culver High students have been talking about, and um, I'd love to talk to you more about that. I'll just add that I, I, I um, was at a, a, a conference at UCLA um, several months ago um, when, with the Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, and I, asked the question about, you know, can we make 16-year-olds uh, able to vote in the entire state of California? And he said, you know, that would take a, um, an amendment of the California Constitution 
in order to do that, which is kind of a heavy lift. It means that it would go to the voters um, and none of those voters would be 16. It would go to 18 and up. Um, but he said in the meantime, uh, what would be a positive way to um, kind of advance that idea is for to show how many 16 year olds are actually interested. In other words, the more 16 and 17 year olds who actually pre-register will make a stronger argument um, to push the idea of making it legal throughout the state for um, 16 and 17 year olds uh, to be able to vote. Another thing that we have is um, we have our own committees, commissions, and boards in uh, Culver City, like a planning commission, a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee. Uh, we just formed an equity and human relations committee uh, recently. And one of, the, uh, one of the things that our city council voted on not too long ago was we wanted to give the ability for 16 and 17 year olds to serve on these committees, commissions, and boards because your voices are just as important as you know the voices of people who are 18 and up. And so we actually have um, uh, some openings on some of our committees, commissions, and boards. Um, we will be uh, deciding who will serve um, in the month of May. And so if you are interested in serving um, those, you can look at our uh, website, culvercity.org slash serve and see what positions are open. Um, the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee already has like a designated youth seat. Um, the uh, new uh, Equity and Human Relations Committee is also going to have a youth seat. And then now, all of those committees, commissions, and boards are open to 16 and 17 and up. Um, so this is, this, it was, it got kind of um, controversial because um, I, I feel like a lot of adults um, had very negative things to say about 16 and 17 year olds. That really shocked me. I mean, I've got, I've got a, I've got a 15 and a now 18 year old at home. And I, I you know, I, they are perfectly capable of, <laughs> you know, being responsible and um, have good decision making. And, you know, if, when you talk about re representation, it's really hard to make good decisions and good policies if not everybody in your community is represented. So having people from different ages and different backgrounds and different races and different religions is really about having a better democracy. And so I've been really concentrating on opening up that process in our city um, so we can have you know, more voices and more more seats at the table, more people being represented, so that we come out with better decisions that benefit the entire city. So I'd encourage you, if you're at all interested, if you have the time, um, to go to culvercity.org slash um, serve. And then now um, I can stop sharing this and, um, and, and happy to uh, answer questions, get into more of a dialogue, and I'm, I'm uh, really curious to hear from you about what you're thinking and what you're hoping and and what we can do to better serve you as a city. So I'll stop talking now. <laughs> uh, Caitlin and Lacey are going to uh, have we had some questions and Caitlin and Lacey are going to help with that. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm just pulling up the questions right now. In one second, let me see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so one question, um, just kind of a basic question, but um, a few team members were actually wondering, what was your favorite part about being mayor slash city council member, or just your favorite um, part about being like a political leader in general? Um, yeah, I... It's really exceeded my expectations. 
Um, so it's hard to pick a favorite, but um, I, you know, I kind of got into this because, well, it, I was, this is not something that I ever aspired to do or to be in, in my life. It's not like that was part of a, a plan or anything like that. Um, I was, I used to live in Paris, um, I was a translator, and I came back to Culver City um, after my mom died to help take care of my grandmother. Um, I had been um, a, a grad student in Paris and, and then um, was spending most of my time just taking care of my kids, and so um, I, 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 I actually didn't have a clear career path to tell you the truth. <laughs> and, um, but when I came back to Culver City, I started doing a lot of volunteering and I started um, getting involved in my kids' elementary school. They, they went to Lynn Howe, which is like a block and a half from our house. And I, you know, having lived in Paris and um, having traveled in a lot of countries in the world um, and, you know, being a translator and kind of, I, I studied anthropology, right? So I was already really geared to um, try to get beyond my own, you know, limited frame and try to understand people um, from different cultures, et cetera. And, uh, and, and bringing that kind of world vision back to my hometown um, was something that was uh, like, it, it just kind of felt like a lot of the decisions that were being made on a city council level, like didn't address, um, I think some of the needs that I saw and the things that um, as a, as a woman, as a mom, um, I, I wasn't seeing being done. And so uh, I started running because I was like, oh, you know, we need to fill some of these gaps. Um, unfortunately, in, in Culver City's 102 year history, only five women have been elected to the city council. I mean, that is shockingly low. We've only had one, uh, we have one African American finally after a hundred years, right? Like that is insane. Um, we've had no openly gay uh, members of the city council. We've had one Latino. I mean, it's just like the, the level of representation of our community has been kind of shocking <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> and so like for me, it was really important to, to bring more perspectives um, to, to, you know, how this city is run. Um, so I've been really focused on equity. Honestly, I've been really focused too on making sure that, um, that I'm leaving the door open and mentoring people and bringing, you know, you know, helping people um, who, who wouldn't see themselves as an elected official. Like I didn't see myself as an elected official. Like, no, you actually have something to say and your perspective is really important. And so I feel like that's kind of been the, the core of my work. Um, and, and it's something that wasn't intentional to begin with. It just kind of happened organically. Nice. Well, thank you for that answer. That was great. That was <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> um, another one of the questions we have is um, kind of you mentioned a little bit of it before, but when did you initially become interested in political process and how did you get involved in government? And also, what steps do you think are necessary to reach a, le a leadership position like yours? Yeah, again, it was kind of random. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, and really, like, I, I became the chair of my neighborhood association. I started getting involved in, um, you know, the Safe Routes to School program at my children's school because, like, I, one of the things that um, was really eye-opening for me when I, you know, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, um, but then I lived, you know, I was basically from the age of 20, to the age of, um, in my very early 30s, 
I was in France and I was traveling. I did a lot of travels in um, uh, Madagascar, in West Africa. And like that, it, 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 it really opened my eyes to like, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> Just because like we're doing things a certain way, that doesn't mean like it's the right way or it's always going to be like that. Um, and, and really kind of experiencing transportation, like mass transportation and a functioning bus system, a functioning metro system, you know, a bicycle lanes that everybody feels safe on, you know, that sort of thing like that, that really opened my eyes. And so when I moved back to Culver City, I'm like, I'm not going to get back into that car culture that was my whole childhood and up into my 20s. Um, so so I got I, I started the Safe Routes to School program at Linwood Howe Elementary, which is, you know, it's like walk and rollers, what we the walk and rollers program. And so I and and basically since then I've been trying to like build that city um where the cars aren't your destiny. <laughs> you know, they're just one option and there are other options. <laughs> and 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 just kind of even when I first got onto city council, like I didn't realize the power of what we could do on a local level. Um, the other big issue of mine is climate change because I think we should survive as a species and I think we're on the wrong path, you know, to survival right now. Um, so like it, it turns out that on a local level, you really get to determine your carbon footprint in a major way. And it has to do where you have housing. It has to do where, you know, this amount of space you give over to cars, the amount of space you give for public transportation, the investment in those things. Um, and so like, it really opened my eyes to like, oh my gosh, this stuff is super important. Obviously like voting on the president and all of that, you know, Congress, that is consequential, but like the, I, I wish more people knew how important it is to vote on a local level because most people ignore that. And it actually is, it has more consequence than, than I think any, anybody really kind of understands. Um, what I've started saying is like, mayors will make or break the planet. And I truly believe that. Um, oh, and you said, what are the steps like to leadership? I mean, I think it's like what you're doing now. It's just like being interested, being engaged, um, being open, um, and then and and caring. <laughs> like, if you don't care, please don't do this job. <laughs> so sorry. Go ahead, Jalisa. Um. Hi, yeah, I'm Jalisa. So I had a question regarding um, how has your experience being a female leader, do you think that you, like, what are some challenges that you face being a woman in local government and politics? Has it, has there been challenges? Has it been, do you think it's the same journey that it would have been if you were of the opposite sex or is being a female kind of, has it brought any um, challenges to your journey? Oh, yeah. I mean, when I first was running, I, you know, I, <laughs> I will never forget this. <laughs> so, so when you're in, when in Culver City, like, it, it's a pretty accessible city, right? So when you're running an election, basically, you try to knock on every door, you want to meet every voter. And, you know, our population is 40,000. Um, there are about 17,000 um, households. And, and you can really like go and meet people. So I was, I was in the middle of walking a neighborhood. Um, I get a call on my cell phone and I'm standing on the sidewalk and a, what sounded like an older gentleman took the effort to call me to complain about my hair. Like I burst out laughing because I'm like, um, <laughs> are you sure you don't want to talk about policies? And he was like so earnestly talking about my hair and how he didn't like my hairstyle. <laughs> and I just, 
I, I was just in a state of shock. Like I was, I think it was about 2010, you know, like that's not that long ago. <laughs> and, and I'm like, sir, you know, I'm trying to be polite, right? <laughs> I still want us vote, but I'm like, sir, well, what do you think of the gentleman's hairstyle <laughs> in, this, in this election? And I mean, like things like that are just insane. Um, but they're super real. And, and he had like zero self-awareness about what that meant, right? Um, and then, there, you know, I think there's just kind of like, oh, oh, sweetie, it's not your time. Oh, you're too young. Oh, you're too this. Oh, you're too that. Like, also, when I was elected, I was the youngest person. It's probably hard to believe, but like, I was the youngest person on the council. And up until... Um, this last election, I was still the youngest person on the city council. Um, so it, 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 there, there was kind of like that younger person plus being a woman um, that, you know, I got a lot of kind of patronizing uh, comments, even from other women. You know, it's the kind of like, oh, honey, wait your turn you know, type of thing. <laughs> and, and, and you can see like I, in, in, in previous councils, because um, I've, I've currently I'm the longest serving council member uh, in in Culver City. I've I'm I'm eight years in, and um, so I've been through. I've had a lot of colleagues over the years, and I've definitely sensed, um, you know, the oh, kind of like, you know, you're talking too much, you know, <laughs> this type of thing. <laughs> Um, and so that, that stuff is, is real. And my reaction has been, um, to, to mentor women, uh, because I, we absolutely need more women on every level of government. Um, it is, it is shocking that we've had so few women in Culver City. It's not like we're some you know, in some conservative state in, you know, some backwater place, like, this is the middle of Los Angeles, right? Um, and, and even the LA City Council has had very few women, has never had a woman mayor in the city of Los Angeles. So it's like, you know, when I see these barriers, like, I feel like it's my job to break them down. And then the way to do that is um, to, to mentor people and enable them to not only recognize themselves as leaders, um, but to, to kind of get the, you know, there's there are there's a there's a skill set, you know, there's there are methods to getting elected. Obviously, nothing is guaranteed, but um, once you kind of understand the system, you can help others. Uh, and and so I've definitely been doing that. Again, like I've been trying to mentor women this for <laughs> ever since I was first elected. Um, I'm now, I'm going to be termed out in November and I'm working very, very hard to make sure that it, for the, at least my seat will, will have a, a, a woman. And if it doesn't, shame on us. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. So kind of shifting gears, um, I was wondering, and then the rest of the team was also wondering, um, how do you think we can increase interest in like researching candidates, policies, especially in young voters? And also, do you have any favorite like news platforms or um, like media resources for credible information? Yeah. Um, so for the media, for the media part, um, I do, I get the um, LA Times, I think they do a lot on local news and there's like a California section um, that's really important. Um, I, I also um, listen to KPCC and that's like public radio. I mean, we've got NPR right here in Culver City, right? <laughs> um, and, and they do, um, they have a website called LAist, L-A-I-S-T. And they do a lot of really good like local coverage um, because if you're if you want to be informed on a local level like that th those sources of information are really important um, I, I 
I, I read The Guardian for a, an international perspective. That's a British, you know, the big British paper, but they have great reporting. And then, um, and I have subscriptions, digital subscriptions to uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, <laughs> and the New Yorker. So like I, I definitely, like I don't read every single paper every, I like I read the LA Times every day, but I don't read everything cover to cover, you know, mostly it's like articles here and there. Um, but I think journalism is a super important and for those who are in a position to be able to support it by subscriptions, like now is the, definitely the time to do that because there's kind of like a war against the media right now um and a lot there's kind of a lot of trash out there too so having those like reliable sources is is really really key and i'm sorry the first part of your question i'm forgetting um it was like how do you think that we should be getting younger voters interested in like local coverage and in even in international or even like on a national level like just news in general like current events i mean i think it's a question of like connecting the dots and like what why does it matter why does me paying attention to this equal <laughs> like <laughs> my survival like climate is a really clear one right like we we need um we need to be engaged um so that um so that we I mean, I, I I always talk in these terms, like it, it really is our survival as a species that's on the line. I don't know if anybody has differing opinions that's on this call, but um, like if you want to go down and talk about that, we can. Um, the I, I think the most important thing, though, is like, you know, to find the thing that you're passionate about and start there. Um, when I was um, in my early 20s and then in my late 20s having kids like I was definitely not as I wasn't reading the paper <laughs> like I am today like I would occasionally I would still read the New Yorker because my mom used to read the New Yorker and I would, would read the cartoons you know as a kid and so I had like this <laughs> sentimental connection to it um, and, and so it, I, I feel like the and it's not like you have to do everything but if you can do one thing and you follow that thing that is really important to you, um, I know that, you know, gun safety is one of those fundamental things. And it's one of those things where youth have really been leading in the efforts to wake adults up to like, dude, this is not working. <laughs> right? Like what, the status quo is definitely not working. Um, and, and it's unacceptable. So like, if it's just paying attention to that issue or, you know, hunger or, you know, equity or racial justice, like these types of things, I would, I would just say like, pick that thing and follow that thing. Nice. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> In light of, sorry, you can probably hear the motor going on outside, um, but in light of, you know, quarantine and coronavirus, um, how has it been leading our community through these unfortunate and uncertain circumstances? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, um, what a scary time, you know, I'm, I'm talking to, you know, I'm talking to people, I was talking to someone I went to high school with whose whose dad just died alone they couldn't have a funeral um you know like where how do you mourn like ha and she was getting over covid-19 herself um it, the as of the last count we have um about 270 people experiencing homelessness in Culver City. There are probably more that are invisible that didn't, you know, get counted. Um, people who have lost their jobs, people whose businesses are shutting down, um, people who are sick and suffering. Like I, I it, it is, it's somewhat overwhelming um, to, to, to not only you know, think about all of these different situations, but to try to respond to the needs. And so our, our answer has been um, 
to feed and shelter people as as quickly as we possibly can. Um, in Culver City, we're really, really lucky because we have an excellent fire chief and an excellent city manager who have who have experienced um, crises before um, and who kind of have a, a a protocol of how to respond to them. So way before most of us were paying attention to the crisis, um, they kind of already had, you know, we're following through on their plan, making sure that we have enough protective equipment, um, making sure that we're staffed up and available to, you know, deal with an influx of, of um, medical cases and you know making sure that all of our hospitals and it's have what they need um, checking in on all of our assisted living facilities for seniors um, so we thankfully we were kind of ahead of the game um, and then we've been uh, you know our senior center on a normal day would have fed you know over a thousand people per day right and so now what we're doing is we're delivering all those meals. Um, we're providing a lot of, you know, seniors get, a, you know, isolation is a real problem among older um, adults. And so like, how do you actually like provide that social cohesion in when you're doing social distancing? So we're doing checkup calls. We have a ton of both staff and volunteers who are just calling people and checking in on them and saying like, hey, how are you doing? Like, a, a, just like a friendly voice. And if they need something, we can help, you know, con connect them with those services. Um, but also, you know, just hearing another voice um, wow. is, is really key as well. Um, it, it's been, so I, I can share this with you. Um, I'm sorry if you're, it, my husband's office is right next to mine, so I'm sorry if you are hearing <laughs> too many voices. Um, I, um, I, so I just stepped down as mayor because we were doing our rotation and usually we would have done a state of the city um, address. And instead of that, I'm like, oh, well, what are we going to do? Like a state of the city seems like a really weird thing. So my husband and I made a video to kind of like think about this current moment. If you'd like, I can share it with you. I don't know. Are you interested? It's like three and a half minutes long. Yeah. Okay. Do you have time for that? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll get out of um, full screen mode on this. And I, I think it just kind of shows what I'm thinking in this current moment and um, and 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 how you know the city has has responded. Wait, oh wait, I can't go in full screen yet. Hold on. So let me do the screen share. Here we go. I think that's it. Tell me if this doesn't work, let me know. Can you see it? Yeah, okay, cool. Dear Culver City, there's no other way to say this. It's a time of terrible loss. Our normal lives have been turned upside down. We're fighting for our lives. We're fighting for our livelihoods. We've made changes and made sacrifices like never before. We're in an extraordinary state of interdependence where our safety depends on social distancing. Today, being a good neighbor means staying at home. We share from a safe distance. We make real connections virtually. We transform our days, our lives, not just for ourselves, but mostly for others. 
the essential workers among us are the unsung heroes holding us all together. Altruism is the answer to this extraordinary threat. We step up for one another, we solve problems, and we transcend our limitations. The support comes from all sectors and in all forms. Donations, volunteers, check-in calls, grocery giveaways, a friendly wave from across the street, and a chalk message on the sidewalk. Thank you for rising to meet this challenge, beautiful Culver City. We still need to hold strong. By staying apart, we're coming together. And together, we'll get through this. To you, our city workers, you have stepped up in an extraordinary way during this crisis. You've completely refocused your efforts on keeping us safe. You're responding to the emergencies, feeding and serving our seniors, providing a helping hand for those in need, and finding answers to every question. You're keeping the lights on, the trash picked up, the streets clean, the water, the buses, and the council meetings running. Your talent, dedication, commitment, and grace under pressure are outstanding. For the past eight years, I've worked alongside the best and the brightest. And I couldn't be more proud or more thankful for what you do in this time of great need and every day. It's been an honor to represent the city for the past year as your mayor. And unexpectedly, to see us through to the end of this crisis. Thank you. can share the link if 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 you all want to see that um another time but um i think the 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 weird and challenging part about this moment is like we we can't we need each other like we've never never needed each other before except that we're physically separated <laughs> and it's like how do you <laughs> how how do you deal with that? And I, I think, you know, Culver City has done a really good job, um, the overall, and you kind of wonder and hope that we can keep it up and, and question like, okay, how long is this going to last? You know, what does, what does normal look like? Is, are, are we ever going to go back to what things were like you know, I'm calling it BC before COVID. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. And, and, and then there's a part of me that, um, you know, there's like both opportunity and, 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 and just kind of excruciating loss. And so the opportunity is that, you know, society wasn't working for everybody before this happened can we make it better as we as we move through this because we know things are going to be different but can they be different in a in a positive way like it, it it's kind of like um it, it's kind of like a really painful reboot you know where um this as we as we make it through this crisis there's an opportunity for change and i'm hoping that um 
I'm hoping that people will feel empowered to be part of that change and insist on things being better. Um, because there's <laughs> like the, I, I've, I'm sorry, I'm having a trouble. I'm having trouble articulating it because it's just like things that I'm feeling so deeply. Um, but it feels like every single challenge and problem we've had as a society and certainly in Culver City is because there's this huge gap in the, the very, very poor and the very, very rich. And, and it feels like to me, like every problem we have kind of points to that that difference, that those extremities. And it's just like, I, I don't think it should be acceptable for so few to have so much. <laughs> like it just doesn't seem possible. And so like we're how can how can we insist on a recovery that that corrects those problems and that starts a new chapter? And 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 that like and I don't want to let, I, so I'm Gen X, right? I'm not a boomer. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm definitely not a millennial. <laughs> like, and I almost feel like my role is to kind of like, okay, let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's bring these. I, I want to lift up the, the generations that are younger than me and, and help and, and, and help take care of the older generations and, and let us move on to like this new leadership that for me is like more representative of um, where I think we should be as a society. There's just, uh, there, there needs to be new leadership in this country. <laughs> that's, that, that's on every single layer of government. Like that is just my fundamental belief. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing that video and sharing your perspective. It's been really valuable um, and for giving your time to this <laughs> presentation today. Um, we kind of want to just wrap things up with a more positive note. Do you have any book or podcast recommendations to keep busy? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I am... Uh, I, my favorite podcast is on the media. Mm -hmm. It's pretty wonky, but I feel like it has like the most relevant things to say at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I li really listen to. I also listen to like the daily, the New York times, the daily and, you know, housing podcasts and things like that. <laughs> um, and then uh, we're, <laughs> we are listening to um, the Harry Potter books again. I love those books. <laughs> I love them. And it feels like this, it's like really, um, it, it kind of gets me out of my own head thinking about somebody else's challenge. And <laughs> I, I don't know, I just, it just totally brings me back. So, um, we've been listening to that as a family because <laughs> it's, um, I don't know, just the moment seems, um, seems right. Do, do you all have a podcast? Like, what are you listening to and are you making one? I don't have a podcast, but I love the Future Thinkers podcast. Oh, cool. I'll check it out. It's, I like it because it, it kind of intersects with global issues, but then also with like science and technology and then it brings on a lot of um, interviewees that I also follow like their own podcasts and ideas. So it's just really great to listen about like philosophy and then it's connection to like science and like the modern world. <laughs> great. Yeah. Awesome. I work, my voice not working. Uh, yeah, I'm not a huge podcast listener, but I do listen to NPR with my parents all the time because that's what they listen to, and so I've been doing that, but I've also been reading, like, currently I'm reading a book about existentialism. Wow. Because yeah. why not? Yeah. <laughs> Corona time, you might as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I, I'm not a big podcast listener either. I have listened to a couple that, like, Spotify has to offer, but I haven't, like, delved into 
like the podcast realm. I've been more Netflixing, but I am also reading um, the book that I'm reading right now, which I really like. It's called Just Mercy. And it's, it's, um, it's kind of in light of like what we're discussing. It's more, it's about the justice system, but it still has to do with like being an informed voter in the sense that like, um, as voters, we need to realize the, like, there's a lot of corruption that goes on with being wrongly convicted and in the justice system overall. And the book brings, it narrates the story of a man who has been wrongly convicted and I'm only halfway through, but it's been like a really good book, especially right now, just to kind of think back on like, there's these issues that we've had for a long time that we also haven't seen, but like the this whole situation and circumstance that we're in right now has allowed me to realize that there's a, a lot of unseen things that we like overlook, especially as like young adults as well, you know? So that's what I've been currently reading. I highly recommend it if you guys are looking for a book to read as well. Yeah, I saw the movie. It was excellent of Just Mercy. Yeah, I'll have to read it. What um, social media platforms are you on? Uh, well, I'll speak for myself. I, I haven't, re I'm not allowed to have social media with the exception of um, TikTok which has been very addictive during this time in quarantine. But like for me, that's kind of like how I've been able to interact with like my friends and just like watching the funny videos they post or like the art videos they make or dancing videos, you know, things like that, where it's just like, as just seeing their face virtually in like a space like that has helped, you know. Their, their U.S. headquarters is in Culver City. Yeah, it's like near the mall, I believe. It's yeah. In that area, yeah. Any others? I'm just curious because, like, I need to know how, where to broadcast to that I'm not doing, <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm Twitter and a little bit Instagram. I, I want to do more Instagram, but it's mostly Twitter. I, for me personally, I'm mostly on Instagram, but um, recently I haven't really been on social media, surprisingly. I think it's kind of like when you, you're not really restricted from something, you don't really want, want it any, <laughs> anymore. And I feel like because I have so much time to be on Instagram, I just don't really want to. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I'm the same with Lacey, where I find that I'm talking to people less. Like, you would think that you'd want to stay in contact with your friends, but I don't know. I feel like if I want to FaceTime them randomly, I will, but I'm not, like, I'll get a message and I won't respond to it until, like, 10 hours later. Not because I don't see it or because I don't want to respond to it. I just, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. It's an interesting, like, pause moment right now. <laughs> Well, thank you again so much for your presentation, for sharing your experiences. It's been really, it's been really great. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I'll, I'll um, send some of the links to Adrian to, in, in case anybody was interested. <laughs> it's been right. great talking with you. Thank yeah. you so much. We really appreciate your time. Bye, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.